Hello, and welcome to our April 2021 Second Thursday Talk. I'm Kathy Powers, Communications Manager here at the National Automobile Museum. Since we just wrapped up Women's History Month, today we're going to highlight just a handful of women who have changed and influenced the automobile industry we know today. Historically, the automobile industry has had a reputation of being a man's territory. However, there are some pretty innovative and influential women that have played a major role. Let's get started with Margaret A. Wilcox. You can thank Margaret Wilcox for that toasty warm car ride the next time you're driving on a cold and snowy northern Nevada day. Miss Wilcox was one of the few female mechanical engineers in the late 1800s. She invented a way to direct the warm air from over the engines back into the car and warm the occupants' toes. Her invention was received well, but there were a few safety concerns because the temperature couldn't be controlled. Wilcox was able to get a patent for her heating device in 1893, and her design is the basis of today's modern heating system in cars. Next on my list is Bertha Benz. You know how they say that behind every successful man is a woman? That saying could have originated with Bertha Benz. Bertha's husband, Carl Benz, designed what is considered to be the first practical automobile put into series production. She believed in Carl so much that she invested her entire dowry in his company. In 1886, Carl Benz registered the first patent for the motor car. The public was skeptical at first and unwilling to purchase a horseless carriage. They turned their noses up at Carl Benz and his invention, but Bertha, who was far better at business than her husband, took it upon herself to show people what the motor car could do. On August 5, 1888, 39-year-old Bertha drove from Mannheim to Forsheim with her 13- and 15-year-old sons in a Model 3 without telling her husband and without permission of the authorities, thus becoming the first person to drive an automobile a significant distance. Although the supposed purpose of the trip was to visit her mother, Bertha had other motives to prove to her husband, who had failed to adequately consider marketing his invention, that the automobile in which they both had heavily invested would become a financial success once it was shown to be useful to the general public and to give her husband confidence that his inventions had a future. Before this trip, motorized drives were merely very short trials, returning to the point of origin made with assistance of mechanics. Following wagon tracks, this pioneering tour covered a one-way distance of about 106 kilometers, or about 66 miles. She left Mannheim around dawn, solving numerous problems along the way and demonstrating her significant technical capabilities on the journey. With no fuel tank and only a 4.5 liter supply of petrol in the carburetor, she had to find Legroen, the petroleum solvent needed for the car to run. It was only available at apothecary shops, so she stopped in Wieslock at the city pharmacy to purchase the fuel. At the time, petrol and other fuels could only be bought from chemists, and so this is how the chemist in Wieslock became the first fuel station in the world. She cleaned a block fuel line with her hat pin and used her garter as insulation material. A blacksmith had to help mend a chain at one point. When the wooden brakes began to fail, Benz visited a cobbler to install leather, making the world's first pair of brake linings. An evaporative cooling system was employed to cool the engine, making water supply a big worry along the trip. The trio added water to their supply every time they stopped. Berth reached Forsheim just after dusk, notifying her husband of her successful journey by telegram. She drove back to Mannheim several days later. Though people were startled by the motor wagon chugging down the road, the trip received a great deal of attention, just as Bertha had intended. In addition to her contributions to the machine's design, Bertha helped finance the development of the motor wagon. She would hold patent rights under modern law, but as a married woman, she was not allowed to be named as an inventor on the patent at the time. Bertha Benz is known as a trailblazer and quite possibly the best PR agent ever. Carl Benz was inducted into the Automotive Hall of Fame in 1984. With Bertha's induction in 2016, she and Carl became the first married couple ever inducted into the Automotive Hall of Fame. You've probably heard of Joan Newton Cuneo. Cuneo was the best known female speedster of her day and has the distinction of being the first woman driver 
to compete in the first Glidden Cup Tour in 1905. She was one of 40 motorists who competed in the 800-mile contest from New York to New Hampshire's White Mountains and back. On her way to Hartford on the first day, she was driving her white steamer at a heavy clip. At Bridgeport, she was closely following Harlan Whipple when suddenly he stopped, having been flagged down by workmen in the road. Cuneo attempted to maneuver around him and slid off a bridge into the creek below. The white landed on its side, its driver shaken but uninjured. After the workman righted the car, she resumed her journey, arriving at her destination with only a few penalty points. She arrived slightly tardy at Hartford. While the gentleman dined with 150 local motorists, Cunia was shunted off to another room to be entertained by a special committee of Hartford ladies. On the way to New Hampshire, she was one of six nabbed for speeding and had to pay a $15 fine on the return journey. All of this kindled rather than dampened her spirit. She competed in subsequent Glidden's and soon took her cars to the racetrack. The New York Times often wrote of her exploits. After breaking speed records and beating Ralph De Palma in New Orleans in 1909, the Automobile Association of America banned women drivers from their races. She accepted the verdict meekly, but continued to buy new cars and strip them down for racing. She still competed in events that were not sanctioned by the AAA and set several unofficial women's speed records. She wrote articles on motor and for magazines and was a valued spokesperson for the Good Roads Movement. However, she would never again have the opportunity to do what she wanted most, compete against the best male drivers of the time. However, she still loved fast driving and collected the speeding tickets to prove it. Another important woman in automotive history is Alice Ramsey. Alice was the first woman to travel from New York City to San Francisco and only 152 of the 3,800 miles were actually paved. She was 22 years old when she first made the trip with her three female friends, none of which could drive. Alice started her trek on June 9, 1909 in a rain-drenched New York City with a crowd of wet photographers gathered to snap pictures of an automobile and the four ponchoed cloaked women within. The car itself was a dark green, four-cylinder, 30-horsepower 1909 Maxwell DA a touring car with two bench seats and a removable roof. But the cameras focused particular attention on the woman in the driver's seat. Just over five feet tall, with dark hair below her rubber helmet and visor, she posed. Then she kissed her husband goodbye and cranked the motor to start the car's engine. Off the Maxwell drove with a clank of tire chains, westward on the transcontinental crusade, the first all-female cross-country road trip. Ramsey hadn't set out to make feminist history. Ironically, two men laid the groundwork for her trip. Her husband set the wheels in motion the previous year after a monster scared Ramsey's horse when it sped past at 30 miles per hour. John Ramsey thought it wise to purchase his wife a car as well. Ramsey took to driving, and that summer she clocked 6,000 miles traveling the mostly dirt highways near her Hackensack, New Jersey home. When she entered an endurance race, a 200-mile trip to and from Montauk, a man representing automaker Maxwell Briscoe marveled at her driving prowess and came up with an idea. He proposed an all-expenses-paid trip, courtesy of the company, if Ramsey showed the world that a Maxwell could take anyone, even a woman driver, all the way across America. During the 3,800-mile road trip, Ramsey had to change 11 flat tires kept the spark plugs clean, had to use water to cool the radiator, and they had to replace a broken brake pedal. Ramsey was also the first woman to be inducted into the Automotive Hall of Fame in 2000. You'll remember Mary Anderson the next time you're driving in the rain. After seeing trolley drivers get out and wipe their windshields in the rain, Mary Anderson knew there had to be a better way. Anderson designed the first manual lever that operated a wiper from inside the car. Thanks to her thinking, we can drive more safely in the rain. Thanks to Florence Lawrence, we don't have to manually wipe that windshield. Young Florence made her motion picture debut in 1906. The next few years would see her rise to become what is generally regarded as the first movie star. Starring in nearly 300 films throughout the course of her career, Florence found herself with a constant flow of work, and she was soon wealthy enough to purchase an automobile a somewhat extravagant rarity for women at the time. Finding a sense of freedom and enjoyment behind the wheel she'd never experienced before, 
Lawrence took to driving much as she had taken to acting. Delving headfirst into the world of the automobile, Florence sought to learn all she could about the vehicle's various mechanisms in between enthusiastic drives. Her love for the automobile led Lawrence to explore additional safety measures to ensure the vehicle's continued practical use. In 1914, after years of learning about and tinkering with automobiles, Florence devised a mechanism that served as a signaling arm for drivers wishing to turn. Through the simple push of a button, her simple invention raised and lowered a flag on the rear bumper of the automobile to inform drivers where the car was headed next. Along with this, she developed an equally simplistic and ingenious device to alert fellow motorists of an upcoming stop. Upon depressing the brake, a small sign reading stop would pop up in the rear of the car. Though rudimentary in design, her inventions would ultimately prove invaluable on the road. Unfortunately for Lawrence, however, she failed to patent this creation, or her next, the first electric windshield wiper, which began selling in 1917 under the Bridgewood Manufacturing Company. They became standard pieces of equipment in personal cars only a few years later, with Cadillac leading the pack. Another actress turned inventor is Hedy Lamarr. Best remembered for her acting career, Lamarr is known in invention circles as the mother of Wi-Fi. Her frequency hopping technology, patented in 1941, paved the way for Bluetooth and GPS. In 1997, the Electronic Frontier Foundation held Lamarr's invention as a key component of wireless data systems and her patented concept of frequency hopping is now the foundation of wireless networking systems and cell phones. She was inducted into the Inventors Hall of Fame in 2014. If we're going to mention the Hall of Fame, we must talk about Betty Skelton. Betty was born in Pensacola, Florida in 1926. During her early childhood years, she played with model airplanes, not dolls. Betty spent every moment of her spare time sitting on the back steps of her home watching the training aircraft soaring overhead from the Pensacola Naval Air Station. At age eight, she convinced her parents that she wanted to fly and began reading every aviation book she could find. The skeletons drove her out to the municipal airport at every opportunity, and Betty hopped rides whenever a pilot had a spare seat. A young Navy ensign, Kenneth Wright, began teaching the entire family to fly. Betty made her very first solo flight at the age of 12 when Wright let her take the controls of his tailor craft. She soloed legally on her 16th birthday and quickly earned her private license. Within a few years of graduating from high school, Skelton earned her commercial pilot's license, becoming a flight instructor, and learned aerobatics in Tampa. Betty began performing aerial stunts in air shows in the mid-1940s and established more combined aviation and automotive records than any other in history. She won the Women's International Aerobatic Championship three years in a row from 1948 to 1950. She became the first woman to perform an inverted ribbon cut only 10 feet above the ground. In 1949, she set the world light plane altitude record in a Piper Cub, 25,763 feet. In 1951, she set the world record plane altitude record in a Piper Cub, 29,050 feet. She set the world speed record for piston engine aircraft, P-51 racing plane over three kilometer course at 421.6 miles an hour. In the mid 1950s, she developed a passion for land speed racing at Daytona Beach and traveled across the country setting records. In 1959, Skelton was asked to undergo numerous physical and psychological tests given to the original Mercury 7 astronauts. She landed on the cover of Look magazine, and although she would have loved the chance, she never had any illusions that a woman would be selected for the Mercury program. Instead, she charmed the Mercury 7 astronauts with her vivacious personality and her impressive flight skills, so much so that they named her Seven and a Half. In 1956, she became an advertising executive and worked with General Motors on and in their TV and print ads. She was GM's first technical narrator at major auto shows, where she would talk about and demonstrate automobile features, later becoming official spokeswoman for Chevrolet. She helped launch Corvette News, the company's internal employee magazine, and served as its editor for many years. 
The publication is now known as Corvette Quarterly. In 1965, she set a new land speed record for women, clocking in at 315.72 miles per hour at the Bonneville Salt Flats in Utah. For more than a half a century, Betty Skelton Franklin has been known as the First Lady of Firsts. In the process of setting 17 aviation and race car records, she also paved the way for women to enjoy equal opportunities in aviation, sports, and business. Nearly 35 years after retiring, Betty still holds more combined aircraft and automotive records than anyone in history. As you can see here, her Hall of Fame inductions is a long list. Next up, the Damsels of Design. The Damsels of Design represented the first six women employed by General Motors in the automobile design field in Detroit in the mid-1950s. It's cringeworthy by today's standards, but this is the 1950s we're talking about. Harley J. Earl, Vice President of Styling at General Motors, was the executive behind this idea. He hired women because he felt they possessed unique insight and excellent attention to detail, talents he found immensely useful to, for designing interiors, suggesting colors, and selecting fabrics. These women had degrees in industrial design, were an average age of 25, and were hired to contribute a feminine viewpoint in the appearance, comfort, and utility of interiors in GM automobiles. Each was assigned to a five-man team working on color, texture, and trim of interior upholstery fabrics and shaping seats, door handles, armrests, and steering wheels. The ladies also addressed purely feminine matters such as finishes and details that might snag stockings, objects that might catch on pockets and purses, and enhancing the attractiveness of the interior hardware such as windshield knobs and dashboard controls. Suzanne Vanderbilt was one of these six damsels. Vanderbilt herself is credited with many inventions that are still in use today, like retractable seat belts and glove boxes. Staying with GM for the next 23 years, Vanderbilt eventually worked her way up to chief designer for Chevrolet. She was never able to completely break into the male-dominated industry, but she is responsible for three patents. An inflatable seat back, a safety switch for automotive panels, and a motorcycle helmet design. This list wouldn't be complete without Mary Barra. Ms. Barra broke a nearly impenetrable glass ceiling in January of 2014 when she was named Chairman and CEO of General Motors. Her appointment marked the first time a woman headed a major automobile manufacturer. She earned her stripes coming up through the ranks at GM from her first position there in 1980 at just 18 years old. Her job then was checking fender panels and inspecting hoods. She credits that time with developing empathy for all GM's workers, saying, My very first job as a co-op student, I was on the line. I want those people to feel motivation and to feel valued and empowered. She subsequently held a number of engineering and admin positions, advancing to the VP level in 2008. Vera worked on the development and introduction of the Chevy Bolt, the company's first all-electric vehicle, and their Ultium battery system. Her announcement recently that GM would abandon fossil fuel vehicles within the next 15 years caught many by surprise, along with a commitment to make their entire company carbon neutral by 2040. She noted that they plan to use 100% renewable energy to power their plants and recently stated on LinkedIn, For General Motors, our most significant carbon impact comes from the tailpipe emissions of the vehicles that we sell. In our case, it's 75%. That is why it is so important that we accelerate toward a future in which every vehicle we sell is a zero emissions vehicle. Perhaps the most significant milestone Ms. Barra achieved was shattering the equal pay for women blockade. By 2017, she was the highest paid of the top three Detroit executives with an annual salary package of almost $22 million. GM has consistently scored well in this area with several indexes reporting that by 2018, GM was one of only two global businesses with no gender pay gap. Forbes recently summarized her accomplishments. If there were a designated slot in the Automotive Hall of Fame for the most important GM chief in the last three quarters of a century, Barra already may have won the votes. Her favorite cars, the Chevy Camaro and the Pontiac Firebird. And last, but certainly not least, is Michelle Christensen. 
Most successful female designers today are celebrated on the pages of Vogue and Vanity Fair. You're more likely to find Michelle Christensen on the pages of Car and Driver or Motor Week, as she is the first woman to lead the design team of a high-performance supercar. In 2015 Car and Driver feature story, she shared that she grew up around muscle cars and hot rods and that her dad was a Mopar guy. She said he cycled through a Plymouth GTX, a Dodge Super B, and a Dodge Dart. When she was 11 or 12, he got into hot rods and bought a 32 Roadster. Christensen went on to say that she was always doodling in class, that she was into drawing and fine art really early on, as well as the mechanics of cars. Her formal training came from the Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, and that led to her first job at Acura in 2005. Her first projects were fairly mundane, working on the exteriors of the RDX SUV and the RL sedan. Her favorite car today is a 67 Chevelle. However, she became the first woman to oversee the design of a car that is probably a very popular dream car, the second generation Acura NSX supercar. The first NSX dramatically vaulted Honda, the parent company of Acura, into the supercar world. It debuted in 1990 and was produced until 2005. The newest version that Christian Sen created is an all-wheel drive hybrid. It features twin turbos on a mid-mounted V6 that powers the rear wheels. There are two electric motors, each driving a front wheel. While its 500 horsepower may not seem impressive compared to the 700 horse muscle cars of today, the NSX weighs only 3,800 pounds. That translates to 0 to 60 in 2.6 seconds and a top speed of 191 miles an hour. It's a beautiful car, but those graceful curves serve a purpose and enhance its performance, such as producing aerodynamic downforce to push the car toward the pavement, which improves traction and cornering, and large graceful vents to feed the twin turbo engine and cool the brakes. Well, there are so many stories of women in automotive history, but that's all we have time for today. I hope you take a few moments to learn more about this interesting subject. Look up Helen Blair Bartlett, Emily Post, yes, that Emily Post, Dorothy Pullinger, Mimi Vandermolen, Helene Rother, Margaret Wu, and Edith Flanagan, just to name a few. Thank you for joining us for the second Thursday talk. We hope to see you at the museum soon.